Starting the recording. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Maddie Nation. I am a senior policy analyst with Homebase. Homebase is a nonprofit technical assistance provider. Uh, we are working with Cal ICH on encampment resolution funding technical assistance. Um, so as part of that technical assistance series, we're doing several what we're calling foundational trainings. Uh, these are high level trainings on topics that are important for folks implementing encampment resolution funding projects to know about. Um, so today we have Patrick Wigmore from the team joining us to talk about continuum of care eligibility. So Patrick, you want to take yeah. it away? Thank you, Maddie. A little bit of background for myself and Patrick Wigmore with Homebase. And I have been working in the continuum of care program, I guess, for almost 16 years now and have uh, managed my own continuum of care before coming over to home base. And then I've also done quite a bit of unsheltered and um, encampment work. And so I thought today would be a good way, especially for those that are newer to the field of homelessness, to be able to understand some of the nuances and differences with uh, the continuum of care program. Um, I think Maddie went over most of those. And uh, I want to, at a very high level, go over what this the Continuum of Care program is, and then really focus on a lot of the eligibility, because it, it has a bit of higher standard, I think, for eligibility than some of the other programs, or um, at least it's a, a higher bar. Um, and part of that is also going to blend into how HUD defines homelessness, because it will be different than some of the other programs that you may have worked with. And it's also one of the, the many challenges that, that people uh, struggle with. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, how to prioritization and vulnerability factors in to if a client could be eligible for a continuum of care funded project, and then as well as how coordinated entry plays a role. So to get us started, we're gonna go back in time a bit and go over the overview of the Continuum of Care program. So back many, many years ago, so 80s and 90s, uh, there was not really a lot of coordination amongst uh, homeless systems of care. So not even thinking of continuums of care, but just thinking of all of the, of the providers. Uh, they were oftentimes fragmented and lacked coordination. And so local agencies, think about your Catholic charities, your Salvation Armies, uh, would oftentimes work completely independent of from one another. And this created a lot of inefficiencies and gaps within the system. And so in 1987, McKinney and Vento, who were a Republican, there are two people, uh, who were a Republican and a Democratic senator. I know one of them's from Missouri, I don't, or uh, Minnesota. I don't remember where the other one was from. Uh, but they started to notice a rise in unsheltered homelessness population. And you think about the time, the late 80s, there had been close of institutions under the Reagan administration. And you also had, for the first time, a very visible uh, Vietnam veteran population uh, starting to uh, show up in many American cities across the country. And so they took it upon themselves to create a legislation that created the first nationwide homeless assistance program. And it was signed into law in 1987 and provided the first comprehensive federal response to homelessness. So part of the McKinney-Vento Act that was a bit kind of uh, in, in, uh, innovative um, compared to other sources of funding, which are mostly just block grant funds to communities, is it didn't only just provide funds to the communities, but it also created a requirement that you created a continuum of care. And the continuum of care uh, emphasized the need to have a coordinated community-driven response to the issue of homelessness and to supportive services. And the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development was uh, decided to take the lead in implementing the continuum of care program. And still today, HUD provides the funding and guidance to local communities to develop and maintain their continuum of care program. So the COC program over time, so into the 90s and into, into today, has really evolved into 
focusing less on uh, trying to solve short-term issues of homelessness, but really trying to solve some of the long-term issues around prevention, rapid rehousing, and also primarily for creating, or not creating, but but being a, a primary source for the permanent supportive housing program today. And this focus shift from managing homelessness to finding long-term solutions and promoting housing stability has been at the core of what the Continuum of Care program has done. And it really aims to aid individuals and families experiencing home homelessness or at risk of being homelessness with a long-term solution and, and really trying to drive communities away from a shelter only or a temporary approach to ending the issue of homelessness. It, it's also done from the impetus of creating the continuum of care. I think they've kept that legacy going as well too by creating community-wide strategies to as, address homelessness that relate to how we deal with homelessness today. So a lot of the technological and coordinated strategies for ending homelessness, so HMIS, and coordinated entry really came or entirely came from the continuum of care funding. And the, I think the biggest uh, focus for them today is to try to broaden them beyond just programs that are continuum of care funded. And it's one of the, the struggles that I think COC programs have, have had to deal with over the last 10 or 15 years as other sources of funding have uh, become available for the issue of homelessness. So a key thing towards the COC program that's important to understand is that it has a very strict eligibility criteria. And it's a critical element to understand that if you want to get your clients, especially those that are in encampments, into the continuum of care program. But for at least us, for the ERF program, the COC program is actually to our benefit, having such high standards, because its primary focus is to help the hardest to serve and to be able to provide the wraparound services that they need to be able to stay house, get housed and stay housed. And so these eligibility criteria for those maybe that are at risk of homelessness or um, sometimes a lot of family agencies will complain that the standards are too high. But for the clients that we're dealing with for ERF, these standards are probably not going to be too high. And I think they actually benefit a lot of encampment residents because um, oftentimes encampments tend to not get as much outreach or case management attention as they probably would. So, I mean, these are going to be the clients that are probably not going to show up at your front door wanting assistance. We are going to need to go out uh, and, and offer them assistance. And so a well-run COC program that's following the, the guidance from HUD should have um, eligibility criteria that actually meets the, the clients that we're dealing with. But a key way to be able to get this is case managers are really going to play a key role in assessing eligibility, as well as being a gatekeeper uh, into these programs. And so if you are an outreach worker or a case manager who doesn't have connections to the continuum of care program, one of the outcomes I want for you today is to be able to understand the need to make connections with some of the continuum of care case managers, because they are going to provide a needed service for us as um, we're trying to provide long-term solutions to encampment residents. This high eligibility criteria is can be a frustration for a lot of providers, a lot of clients, but I think the impetus, and it's important to remember the impetus both of the COC program, as well as why um, the eligibility criteria is so high, it's to make sure that the hardest to serve have the resources that are available. Um, and so the bar is set high, but it's set high intentionally to make sure that, that these resources are dedicated really towards our clients that we're going to be dealing with in this program. It also helps if field case managers really tailor assistance to meet the specific needs of the clients. I think one of the unique things about the continuum care program, we'll talk about this a bit more, is it's not a one size fit all program for a community. And it has a continuum of services and resources 
for the community. And so it helps both the case managers as well as the communities be able to tailor their program for who and how they see best fit to um, end homelessness and their community. Patrick, before we keep going, it looked yep. like maybe Alan, did you have a question? Sure. Sorry. No. No, saying sorry to Alan, have walked away, walking back, okay. not to frantically unmute. But that's a great, feel free, please in, uh, raise your hand or, or interrupt. We're definitely happy to take breaks. I don't have too many slides. No. I, I'm good, thank you. No problem at all. I do want to just reemphasize a point that Patrick already made about us hearing already from uh, encampment resolution funding grantees, folks doing these assessments that in general, even if the community does not seem to be prioritizing unsheltered individuals, the folks that they're working with in encampments are reaching such a level of vulnerability that they're being prioritized anyway. So it's something we're already hearing from communities and there can be, and I think Patrick said this, I'm just saying it in a different voice, like there can be some hesitancy from case managers to engage encampment residents in this eligibility process because it is lengthy, it requires a lot of documentation, there can be a wait, um, but if folks are truly vulnerable, it does seem to be working out in specific communities. Yeah, I did a, um, thanks Maddie, I did a consumer study or um, focus group in the city of San Antonio and it was all it was unsheltered individuals and I asked them how many had been connected to coordinated entry how many had been entered in the continuum of care program and not I think maybe one out of 40 or 50 people raised their hand and it is a big failing I think of the continuum of care program to not be as well connected with outreach services and uh, particularly with encampment population. I mean, it looks different, obviously, in San Antonio than in California, uh, but unsheltered individuals are, are still going to be harder to identify than a shelter-based population. And so we definitely want to make sure, and we'll get into the details how, um, but making sure you're connected to the continuum of care and that your clients are is um, a key thing, I think, for the outcomes that, that we want for ERF. A couple other just high-level things that I think make the COC program a little bit unique and also, I think, strengthen the, the program. Uh, one is um, the efficient utilization of resources. So the continuum of care program is not supposed to be a static funding source. So communities uh, are challenged to be able to every year identify what programs do they need, what programs do they not need, and how do they change their funding stream to be able to, to reflect that. And I think from providers, they can oftentimes get scary because what you need and what you don't need is an agency that was funded one year and is not funded the next. But a good continuum of care program should be looking at their resources annually and being able to make those decisions. It also focuses highly on uh, the COC program on consumer participation throughout the process and um, as well as having client satisfaction, part of that having client satisfaction surveys um, and participation in programs themselves, which is more common nowadays, but certainly five, 10 years ago, it was a bit unique for a lot of the programs. And then finally, it sort of incentivizes and, and dictates a lot of collaboration and, and coordination among service providers, uh, which is, um, definitely needed, especially as uh, agencies are, are not living in their own silos and are trying to work together. So making sure that they are coordinating and collaborating. So well, another unique thing about the COC program is it will vary absolutely by each community. And even each community for a continuum of care is going to look very different. So in the state of California, you're pretty fortunate that most but not all continuums of care are identical to counties in your community. But if you live in Los Angeles County, that's not the case. You have two additional uh, continuums of care. I think Long Beach is its own continuum of care and, and Glenview or whatever the city by Pasadena uh, as two kind of smaller continuums of care. And then you also have some that are multi-county and, and it does vary. And so HUD allows each community to self-identify how they want to um, 
identify what their continuum of care is. And the strategy for that is being that homeless individuals don't know where city boundaries are, oftentimes where county boundaries are. And so continuums of care need to stretch or contract based on where homeless individuals are going, not based on artificial geographic lines um, throughout a community. Um, this may uh, you know, kind of be a struggle, but within those boundaries as well too, you need to operate uh, what's called a coordinated entry system. And so that is a one-stop shop for everyone to be able to apply and enter to be able to get housing and services through it, the continuum of care funded projects and preferably through for all funded projects in, in the area. And unfortunately, like many of the programs, wait lists or a strict prioritization uh, program are, are common amongst these, these programs. There are, I think another unique thing about COC is there's not one type of project that it funds. Um, a lot of SAMHSA projects have very specific kind of uh, requirements for funding. I know a lot of California projects too um, tend to have a bit of, of stretch, but certainly for HUD, they really run the gamut. And I'm just gonna go over the high level ones. Um, but the first and foremost is emergency shelter, uh, which provides you know temporary, assistance to individuals and families offer the basic necessities such as beds and meals and supportive services. And it's typically going to be on a shorter term basis. You see most shelter programs funded through sort of a sister agency of the continuum of care program called the emergency solutions grant, but they're sort of the same in many regards. I think the big thing to remember about shelter is HUD is not opposed to funding shelter, but they don't want it to be the only solution. Um, and they've created sort of their ideal type of shelter project that they fund is one where individuals come into shelter who are either already or are highly likely to enter into a permanent housing project. They don't prefer to fund your typical kind of day shelter that you'd see. Transitional housing programs, are another project that, that we've historically funded in the continuum of care program, but we've also tried to step away from. So a transitional or TH project is going to offer temporary housing, uh, which is usually under two years, as well as supportive services in individual, for individuals and families as they step towards the road of permanent housing. Participants typically have longer stays compared to emergency shelters. And there often is a requirement for um, receiving different types of case management services. So employment services, drug and alcohol treatment programs are oftentimes go part and parcel with these programs. You will still see them. HUD has tried to kind of push communities away from, from funding these and shifting more service heavy projects as we would call them into other funding sources, but they are definitely still around. A newer project type, which we've certainly seen in California quite a bit over the last 10 years, um, is the rapid rehousing program. And this is probably the mainstay now for where HUD likes to put their continuum of care dollars going forward. And so a rapid rehousing project is a program that aims to quickly rehouse individuals and families experiencing homelessness. And they do this not through creating programs, but through usually creating vouchers or rental assistance. Um, so getting individuals who are experiencing homelessness back into a market rate, rate apartment with temporary rental assistance, usually between uh, six and 12 months. And then attached with that are case management and support services to be able to help maintain their housing with the idea that that individual can take over the lease that they are temporarily having once it uh, the subsidy expires. Um, and rapid rehousing programs, I know we've used them a lot in California. They can be a struggle as well too, as far as finding landlords or finding even just units, not even the landlord. Um, and so I know a lot of communities have had that struggle as well too, but an important thing for us to remember in the ERF program is some continuums of care have started to use rapid rehousing project for the chronically homeless individuals. 
and communities have had varying success on it, but it's taking an individual directly from the street into a market rate apartment, probably providing them a bit more services than they may just you know, may for another client. Um, but it presents challenges, but it also does present some opportunities to be able to quickly move someone in to a permanent or at least temporarily permanent solution and, and be able to try to make it work. Other option for our population and probably the more um, classic option that we would use for encampment residents is what what in HUD calls permanent supportive housing or PSH programs. And a, a PSH project will provide long-term permanent housing for individuals or, or families experiencing chronic homelessness. And participants have uh, access to not only the permanent housing that they have, but as well as wraparound case services, including mental health or substance abuse and healthcare services. And the programs really try to focus on, on housing stability and improving overall wellness. So these are obviously the ideal projects for our clients. The struggle is the wait list can be very high and the, the plus side of, of them, you know, being a permanent option sort of makes turnover a bit of a struggle because individuals can can stay as long as they need. I mean, typically individuals do transition out of these projects as they become stabilized and employed, but it's not a requirement of the project. So individuals or families can stay uh, for the, you know, the rest of their lives. So a key thing, and I think particularly because of the permanent supportive housing and the life, the lifetime wraparound services, or actually I can stop. I don't know if Maddie, if there's any questions in the chat box or might be a good place to pause. There are some questions. Yeah, let's go. So the first question here is, well, there's only one. Uh, how right. long is chronic homelessness? What's in the definition of chronic yep. homelessness? So we will define that here. Um, so I can I can definitely answer that. It is a strict definition. And so, as I said, it's strict because of, probably because of permanent supportive housing. Also just because federal programs tend to have pretty strict requirements as well too. Um, but uh, for chronic homelessness, there's a couple different ways that they define it, but it typically is, um, what is it, Maddie? Three, um, three instances over one year, I believe, or eight nine, or six to nine months of of living on the street. There's a standard. I I can look it up when we're doing questions. It's high. Uh, I think the struggle that a lot of communities have is for your average person who's staying in a shelter, they may not meet the chronic homeless definition because of either length of time homeless, the amount of documentation, which I'll go over that is required, or for, for chronic homeless uh, and for permanent supportive housing, you also have to have a disability as well too. So those three things can pose a challenge, but again, for most encampment residents, they're likely gonna have, they're certainly gonna meet the time definition if they've been there long enough, and we can document it, which I'll go over ways in which we can do it. The ability to have a disability or not there, if they have a disability is obviously dependent on having a medical professional to be able to diagnose them. But it, there are certain substance abuse disabilities that are eligible or, or mental health uh, issue disabilities. And so just getting those documented by a medical professional uh, will often suffice for getting into the COC program. Yeah, there's there's the three components. Um, one of them is that you're experiencing homelessness at the time of program enrollment, um, which can include living in a shelter. The part that Patrick was trying to remember, which I also always forget, is you have 12 continuous months of homelessness or four separate occasions in the last three years, totaling 12 months. So again, it's 
four separate occasions in the last three years, totaling 12 months. Um, and then the third piece, like Patrick was talking about, is a qualifying disability. So all three components are necessary for someone uh, to be considered chronically homeless. And like Patrick was talking about, even folks living in encampments, I think something that comes up a lot is they have been experiencing homelessness for that period of time, but uh, it's difficult to document that they have been. Maybe they don't have the right service records in HMIS, um, or they've been living out in the woods and folks are not seeing them in a regular length of time. So Patrick will talk about this in a second, different ways to document that. Thanks, Betty. There's other questions, happy to take them now. Feel free to interrupt or put them in the chat. There we go. I did have it here. Um, so Department of Housing and Urban Development sets the def specific definition for homelessness of the continuum of care program. It obviously determines eligibility for housing and services. And it's really critical for those working in the program to understand where clients fit. And I, I really can't stress that last bullet enough because since there's such a high wait list or wait time and due to a wait list, it's very important to understand someone's chances of getting into these programs. And so we want to make sure that we're not setting up false expectations as well as um, working with individuals for some ideal, you know, permanent supportive housing or a type of project that may be the ideal fit, but either they don't qualify for because of some of the, the issues that Maddie and I talked about as far as documentation, or they're just not eligible as well too. Or if just the wait is so long, it's not an ideal fit. And some California is very fortunate because we have many other sources of permanent supportive housing projects, but in some communities around the country we work in, and including in California, the wait list can be years for someone, for any spot in a PSH project to open. So it's very important to understand those dynamics before you're, you're working with clients um, and setting up eligibility. Um, as Maddie talked about, we can do a whole training on, on eligibility for um, homelessness. I think some of the key terms that I, I want to kind of put into you is the issue of, of literal homelessness. And so I think Maddie talked a bit about this, but that can be you live in a place not meant for human habitation. So that's definitely sleeping in abandoned buildings. Encampments would fall into this, mostly sleeping outside uh, in some way or another. Living, residing in a temporary shelter. So there are caveats to the rules that allow you not to lose your homelessness status if you've gone into shelter, as well as institutions as well, too. So if you are coming out of a criminal justice institution, a mental health institution, drug and alcohol institution, you have up to 90 days where your previous status will still continue and, and moving forward. So the key thing for, for these, and I only am going to document one of these, because um, again, there's just so many different kind of criteria. And I think for our purposes, it's more just understanding what needs to happen versus how. But the appropriate documentation that you would need for someone if you met them in an encampment is, uh, and they're living in a place not meant for human habitation, which an encampment would, would suffice for that, is something that is on the right. So you either need an HMIS record from a street outreach contact. You need a written referral by a street outreach provider. And all a written referral is, is a street outreach provider saying that he has met this individual over X amount of time and has seen them in the same place and different places. So it's a, it's a, a testament of, of their interaction with that individual. Um, Less ideal, but you can get written observation by community members of the individual or the living condition. This can uh, include law enforcement as well, too, who oftentimes have very detailed uh, either information in their own system about the individual or oftentimes a very good institutional memory about certainly chronic homeless individuals uh, over the years. 
you can get written observation by staff of the living conditions and explanation of attempts to secure different types of documentation. As well, it's not completely ideal, but you can um, get certification by the individual themselves or the head of household seeking assistance. We call and um, as well as attempts to secure other third party documentation. And I'll go over a little more detail as far as like what those words uh, or what those standards mean for documenting homelessness. The other, so those are going to be, that, that's the standard. If you want to get into a permanent supportive housing project, you need to be in that category. If you're at imminent risk of homelessness, so that is, uh, includes individuals who will lose their primary nighttime residence um, within 14 days. So this can include having eviction notices or uh, not having suitable housing arrangements going forward. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and so these are, each program has kind of a different standard for what they're gonna have. But so oftentimes rapid rehousing projects uh, will sometimes be eligible in communities for individuals like this, as well as other projects uh, as well that are more on the prevention side. Um, so are trying to keep the individual housed. And then the other sort of big eligibility criteria we have in our program is homeless under other federal statutes. And so uh, this refers to domestic violence individuals who are fleeing a domestic violence situation, as well as youth, homeless youth uh, who are under the age of 25. And um, I think both of these carve outs are designed to make sure that those two populations specifically are not lost. Uh, particularly, I think both are important for us to remember that there are special carve outs uh, for domestic violence and homeless youth in the COC program. Uh, if you encounter uh, individuals in encampments, uh, they certainly can be different programs or eligibility criteria that prioritize them over other resources. So as I talked about going over at a super, super high level, what the definition of homelessness is for HUD, as I said, Maddie and I have done hour long trainings just on that or even multiple hour long trainings. But the key takeaway that I don't want you to really focus as much on the details, but just on the big picture importance that HUD does have a very kind of stringent and pretty high uh, degree of determining how an individual is homeless. And it ensures obviously that resources are allocated to those who are, are most in need, but it does put the onus on case managers and outreach workers to make sure that the individuals they're selecting for these programs will, will meet the criteria and be able to get into the program. So I think, I mean, we, a lot of programs have this problem, but a very reoccurring problem we have on the COC side is individuals will be identified, selected for a project, and then when they get into the program itself, they either don't meet the eligibility criteria, they weren't chronically homeless, they didn't have a disability, or their documentation is lacking. And so on a few instances, COC programs can do sort of what we talked about at the end of that slide, do a third party documentation, but it's not ideal and it's not something that agencies can do across the board. And if they do it too frequently during an audit, HUD will uh, certainly take issue with that. Anything, Maddie, you want to add as far as eligibility or kind of some of the strict nature of the COC program? Yeah, I think if you're feeling stressed about the definitions and the specificity of the definitions, the thing to remember is that your continuum of care and coordinated entry system should be responsive to questions that are coming up about uh, this funding program and what documentation is required. Um, different programs, like Patrick have said, like different continuums of care across the state 
are connecting folks to different resources um, and have different criteria locally about how they're collecting these document, like these pieces of documentation. So even though they're standard, standardized at the HUD level, your local continuum of care likely has tools or resources or additional trainings that you or your staff can access um, to get a better, a better understanding of this topic. Um, and Patrick, I'm not sure if you're going to go over it, uh, but are you going to talk about the definition of a disability or you want me to? No, if you want to. Yeah, I didn't put that in. I want to, I want to keep it, but that's definitely. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. So definition of a disability is really specific. I put a link to the disability definition in the chat because it has so many bits and pieces. Um, but at a high level, it's a physical, mental, or emotional impairment, including impairment caused by alcohol or drug use. PTSD, brain injury, or chronic physical illness that is expected to be long continuing or indefinite duration substantially impedes a person's ability to live independently and could be improved by more suitable housing. Um, they also have some things in here around chronic disability and inability to uh, to take care of three or more major life activities. So definitely check out the link to see the full definition of disability because it is quite detailed. Um, but we often see people verifying a specific disability by um, submitting their SSDI checks um, as proof that they have a disability that qualifies. Uh, folks will get a letter signed by a certified physician those types of things. Um, but the definition of disability is quite expansive, but also quite specific. So it, it, it's a it's a fine line to walk, uh, but many folks with a disability do qualify. Yeah, and as Maddie said too, the program, these programs themselves are used to this process. So you more just need to identify what these types of disabilities are and then take them to these programs and they have staff or medical professionals usually that can diagnose and document the the disabilities. So this is something where I think in my wife, I've said kind of pushing a lot off onto COC funded projects, but this is where something for us as ERF grantees, I think we can be much more proactive about, and that is about how we're documenting an individual in an encampment that we're working with and their the state of their homelessness. So as I talked about, there's different strengths of documentation for an individual that is entering into the program. So a um, first party certification would be a self-certification. So an individual, homeless individual or family says that they are homeless, they've been homeless for X number of years, that they've always been in this site. And those are eligible sometimes, um, but they're not the strongest source. So, I mean, they're always um, obviously have the, the limitation that you're only having one person certify that they were homeless. A, a better source of documentation for COC programs is second party documentation. So this is where an intake worker or a medical worker will document that they've worked with this individual X number of years, and that in their professional judgment, they have definitely meet the definition of being chronically homeless or uh, being homeless for a long period of time. The limitation with second party homelessness is you're oftentimes doing it after the fact. You're not just going around trying to get second party documentation before you've started helping someone. It's always almost entirely done before someone's about to enter a program and we can't document uh, thoroughly that they have been chronically homeless long enough. Um, it is allowed, but again, there's a limit to how many times you can have all of your clients uh, be second party documented. The most preferred way is to be able to have an HMIS record in real time of someone's homelessness status. So as we are doing outreach to these encampments that we have targeted in the ERF program, we should make sure that we are entering in real time every time our outreach workers are going in, out, going out to the site in HMIS, our interactions with the individuals. And this will um, document their homelessness. It'll be the strongest type of documentation. It can also provide many more clues as far as changes in behavior, some issues that um, 
future outreach workers or case managers further down the line as they get into program may need to um, be aware of, as well as it is just the easiest way to make sure that these individuals are prioritized in the system. I mean, as I talked about for my San Antonio example, that was an entire room of encampment residents that are not gonna be assisted by this program. Getting them into HMIS, getting them into coordinated entry, which I'll discuss next, is going to guarantee them that they have a high priority of, of being housed. So give a scenario of, just to kind of put this all into perspective. So John is a 55 year old man who has been experiencing chronic homelessness for the past 10 years. He's been living on the street in various makeshift shelters and occasionally in emergency shelters. He has a physical disability, which affects his mobility and requires the use of crutches for assistance. So for the continuum of care program, he would be eligible due to his chronic homelessness, due to the length of time that he's homelessness, as well as his disability. Um, his extended periods of living on the street, along with his mobility challenges, classifies him as a chronically homeless individual with a disability. He would definitely benefit from a multitude of services that the continuum of care program could operate. If permanent supportive housing was available, that would probably be our first recommendation for him, as well as different um, disability specific services and, and certainly case management as well too, to make sure that he stayed in all of these programs. Like I talked about, PSH would certainly be the first choice, but if it was not available and the communities operate rapid rehousing programs, uh, they may temporarily put John in a rapid rehousing project with either the hope that he can stabilize on his own in that project or that a, a PSH project may open up later on down the line and that we could transition him into that. Any questions on eligibility documentation? Oh, I, the only thing else with John too is documenting his, um, I mean, it says he has been living on the street for, I think so, I thought it said 10, 10 years. Oh yeah, past 10 years. Documenting that is going to be a challenge. So if we had an HMIS record that went back 10 years, that would be fantastic. But what we may have to do is piece together, um, don't need the full 10 years, but you need to be able to meet the definition. And so you, you sometimes have to piece together through self-certification, second priority certification, or ideally third party certification that he does meet the chronic homeless definition from a time perspective and location. So I touched on this, but definitely priority and vulnerability factors heavily into the COC program. Uh, they play a critical role as far as prioritizing who will receive services. And the way that this is done is through what is called a vulnerability index. And so as part of the process for getting into a COC funded program, you need to take a, well not take, but administer a vulnerability assessment of an individual. And the things that are assessed in the vulnerability are gonna play highly into the, the type of clients that we are working with in encampment. So they're gonna screen for substance abuse issues, mental health issues, previous issues of trauma. Um, I mean, just your normal type of case management services. I think the difference or case management type assessments you're going to do. The difference is you're, compare, you're comparing them against other clients that are currently in the queue for services. So the idea behind using these vulnerability indexes is to make sure that we are truly helping the hardest to serve at the moment. And so it's a little bit hard to tell when you're working on what is the wait list for, say, a permanent supportive housing program. Because it's different than, say, a public housing authority wait list or just you know any other wait list that you get on, where usually you get online and you work your way up the line until you're at the top of the, of the list. There's, there's, there's really no getting online for uh, 
a, a vulnerability service, what you're doing is, is you're going to measure it against the other individuals that are currently seeking services. So you could have an individual or a family that is taking a vulnerability index today and skips ahead directly to the first permanent supportive housing program that is available. And it's going to determine based on these vulnerability factors with the idea being, we want to make sure we are getting those that are most like, I mean, this is truly just getting those that are most likely to die on the street into housing as quickly as possible so that um, we can give them the services that they need. The vulnerable populations are gonna look like our populations. Um, I mean, they're gonna be individuals with disabilities, survivors of domestic violence, veterans, Youth sometimes struggle a bit for some of these vulnerability indexes. Um, there's definitely some controversy amongst youth providers as far as if um, they can be a bit skewed towards more chronic homeless population. Uh, but primarily, they're going to skew heavily to assist those with mental health, substance abuse, or co-occurring disorders. Um, and then, as I said, the uh, prioritization of this assistance will occur um, amongst the coordinated entry program, which I'll talk about, or by the coordinated entry program to make sure that these individuals are assisted quickly. Um, the other piece of the continuum of care program is there are a lot of other services connected to it that are for, particularly for, or, uh, for supportive services for the vulnerable population. So HUD has done an, a pretty good job of trying to make sure that even though they don't like communities to do too much shelter, they do understand that particularly the population we're gonna be dealing with, oftentimes or sometimes may not want to come directly to a shelter or even be ready even to come to a permanent supportive housing project from day one. And so they also fund a lot of programs that um, we call them safe havens or supportive service only projects that are really geared towards bringing chronic homeless out of the encampments, out of the fray and into being able to participate in case management and, and different program services as well too, while still living on the street. So it gives them sort of a, a temporary uh, safety for some of these programs with the idea that over time, we can work with these individuals further and also identify them in HMIS and be able to work with them further. The other key thing I think that, that makes the continuum of care program a bit different is it's very outcomes and stability focused. So over the last five or 10 years, they've really changed the program from how many people you work with to how well did you work with the people that you helped? And so a lot of the stability and outcome measurements are more focused on are the people that you've assisted, are they still housed 12, 18 months later? How much employment or benefits have they gained since you've been able to stably house them? So they, you may get asked different questions that you're not used to if you work with COC providers longer term than a lot of other programs. But this is how both the continuums are funded as well as the agencies themselves. And this is, really gets back to the 1987 impetus for the plan, which is to end long-term homelessness. And so I think from a HUD perspective, they would rather house people better than house more people quicker. Uh, and then the other piece too, I talked a bit about this early on, but there is a lot of collaboration and coordination among service providers. Um, and I think a key thing, if you're not familiar with the COC program, is there is a lot of ways to connect either your agency or yourself to ongoing work that they are doing. That most communities have various work groups or um, outreach, sometimes outreach meetings as well too, where any, usually anyone is invited as well too, because you wanna to try to get everyone that's assisting individuals in the community. Your COC lead 
is going to be the best person to be able to talk to this. And I'll detail how to find that agency or individual, but it can really connect you if you sort of feel like you're doing outreach on your own, or you're not really getting the big picture of how your work is, is dovetailing into a broader response community-wide. The COC program work groups can allow you to kind of help to see that picture a bit clearer. And it can also help you reduce duplication of services. And especially amongst encampments, uh, there can oftentimes be multiple people I found assisting the same encampment, um, some directly funded by programs like ERF or other ESG type funded programs. Uh, but you can oftentimes get a lot of volunteer and activists that may work in one encampment or one region as well too. So the idea of the continuum of care program is to connect all of these individuals, regardless where their funding is, um, so that you can start to have a, a coordinated response. So this is a multi-day training as well too, but I'm gonna go over, or I guess I can stop with Maddie if there's any questions in the queue before we go into coordinated entry. There is a question um, and it's asking if there are any requirements for clients to be housing ready. So one of the key, I didn't cover this, but one of the, that's a great question, Sarah. One of the key things that HUD has tried to do amongst its providers is to have really no preconditions for um, individuals to be housed. I, I briefly mentioned that transitional housing projects are a program model that HUD has leaned away from over the years. One of the primary reasons why they have is because a lot of transitional housing projects would have preconditions. And what that what a precondition means is you need to be sober for X number of days. You need to be employed before you can come into our program. If you have mental health issues, you need to be on medication before you can even come in. Or if you're going to come in, you might not be doing that now, but in time, 7, 14, 21 days, a very short amount of time, you need to be doing that. HUD tries at all costs to limit any preconditions. So they do this in several ways. One can be the program rules themselves need to be evaluated by the continuum of care. So if you have a program that has a very high barrier for entry or has a lot of those, those barriers that I discussed, you are at risk of not being funded. Another way that they do this is they want you to treat, especially in rapid rehousing, a client the same way you would treat a market rate tenant who is moving into your program or moving into a unit because many of the units that we're using for this program are have a landlord. They are going to have market rate tenants above and below them. And so they don't want different rules for our client around sobriety or mental health issues than the market rate tenant has above or below. So if you participate in the program, you have to have a lease for the individual that you're housing, and it needs to just be a normal lease, just like the tenants have uh, in the building themselves. And so this really it is attempting to try to limit the playing field so that we don't have too many preconditions, because that is gonna be something that is gonna be a hindrance for our population in the ERF program, because I mean, I hate the term housing ready, but a lot of the clients we're gonna be working with are, are not going to meet that arbitrary definition of what is housing ready. And so we need to make sure that we use programs that have no barriers and that um, that you know, we're accessing these types of services because it, it's hard to go directly from the street to housing, but it certainly can be done if you have the right program. I will say the one area though that HUD does struggle and that's why I covered it is um, I mean, documentation is an element of housing readiness. And so when you're working with individuals, we want to make sure that we're getting them into HMIS, we're documenting their homelessness as best that we can through second or first party documentation, because that could be a barrier later on. So let's say we get into a program from an encampment into a program that doesn't have any preconditions, but we can't document their homelessness they're gonna be at risk of being exited from that program. 
just because of a documentation issue. So we want to make sure we minimize that. Other questions, Sarah or Maddie? Yeah, there was another question. Um, are there any best practices or guidelines out there with regards to chronic encampments? I think, may I can start answering sure. that. I, I don't think chronic encampments is a term that we hear used that often. So I think what you're talking about is many folks living in a single encampment that are experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, and I think the best practice that I would put forward is one that Patrick mentioned, which is uh, if you're an outreach worker on the ERF project, documenting all of your touch points with uh, different encampment residents every time you go out um, to make sure that that documentation exists when someone is trying to prove chronic homelessness or literal homelessness when someone's entering into um, a program through coordinated entry. Uh, but other stuff you want to lift up, Patrick? There can be encampment. I mean, encamp each encampment is going to be very different as far as who resides there and what the the mix of the residents are. There certainly can be encampments that have long term residents that have been there for a very long time. Um, and so, as Maddie said, documenting their homelessness is a critical element to being able to assist them. There can also be encampments that are very transitory as far as who stays and how long they stay. Um, and some of those may be the sites that we've selected for the ERF program. And it's going to be a bit more of a challenge to identify who we're helping. And then all, obviously documentation is also going to be a struggle because you're having new individuals come while other individuals that you may have been helping just the day before have, have moved or are just sort of a natural element to, to the encampment themselves. So I, I think it's important to understand who is at the encampment, and especially for our UF program, where we have a set number of sites, that should be the first step that you do once you um, start the process on this work is to either do a census or be able to, to really get a good understanding of who resides there. Is there any leadership issues that we need to understand? Some encampments will have mayors or long-term residents that definitely carry more sway. Um, than, than other residents in the encampment. Um, but for me, it's just having a clear understanding of what we're dealing with before we get started. Hopefully that answered your question. Anything else, Maddie or Sarah? All right. In the chat, does anybody want to come off mute? I'm going to talk about... Oh, go ahead. Does it make sense to have any discussion um, around, um, you know, individual client-centered work versus locale work? I, I'm new to this field, so um, not sure if that's appropriate to ask in this context. No, no, it definitely is. Um, I, I don't think it's an and or or. I think you want to definitely do both. I, I think for for the ERF program in particular, since we are targeting a single either encampment or, or series of encampments. I, I, think, I think it's important to understand the role, but at the end of the day, you're absolutely correct. This is going to come down to working individually with each member of the encampment and being able to find the best housing solution for them. So I was just saying at a high level when getting started, focus kind of geographically or on the site, but the majority of your time is going to be working with that individual and making sure, or family or whoever its composition is, to make sure that you understand their barriers, their background, and what they need to be able to move out from the encampment on either to a next step or hopefully a permanent housing path. Uh, so we're focusing on an area that is sort of continually re-encamped. And so, um, I feel like besides the individuals, there's also, um, I don't know if it's a prevention aspect or something that's place-based that also will need to happen there. Yeah, those are gonna be the hardest thing. I mean, they're, they're a struggle to be able to deal with encampments like that as far as trying to build rapport. I mean, you have to work with your ERF grant rep. I don't know entirely how you wanna capture the individuals. For some of the sites that we've done, 
not through ERF, but through other programs that I've worked on. We sometimes did sort of a census early on, on a, on a camp that was very transitory and be able to identify at least who the individuals were when we started and then help them wherever they're at. And you're going to need HMIS or some sort of system to be able to do that. And you, that might not be an option with ERF because we're very limited in the geography that we have. But if the spread is within sort of a neighborhood or a region, it is possible to kind of help people as they transition around, you know, a small geographic area. It's going to be harder if, I mean, some encampments um, can have very short-term stays who are not even staying in the area. I know I did a lot of work in Utah. Uh, where it is a very transitory nature for homelessness due to the weather of people coming in the summer and then leaving. Um, so it might not always be possible, but definitely trying to get an idea because oftentimes when you're keeping track of people, it, it may there may be more of a pattern than you realize. I mean, like to the Utah example, it may seem like people are just staying one summer and then they're leaving, but they're never coming back. But what we were able, to, what they were able to do through tracking is realize it's the same individuals every single year. They're just, they were going to Las Vegas for the summer for the, because they couldn't stay in the winter, but they were coming back to the exact same encampment every single year um, on at clockwork. So I think just knowing the situation and, and documenting it as best you can is probably the best way to start to identify some of these trends. Quickly go through coordinated entry is a bit of a kind of a sticky point for the for the continuum of care program. It's the only way you can get staff and client or get clients uh, into being able to get housing and services through the COC program. So it serves as a central entry point for connecting clients with the appropriate housing and supportive services. So each community is going to have a different coordinated entry system and process, kind of like as Maddie has been saying, you don't necessarily need to know verbatim what the process is and what you, where you do it. You just need to know that it's something we need to connect our clients to, someone who's knowledgeable, and then let them use their expertise at entering them. Entering into a coordinated entry is going to use a lot of the same pieces of the puzzle that I've talked about, having an assessment, having a different prioritization process, uh, for identifying who is most in need of housing and services. Uh, and also how you enter or where you enter people is going to vary greatly by each community. So you um, probably not for ERF, but there are multiple coordinate entry systems within small geographic areas since the COC program is kind of frag fragmented. So let's say, for example, if you knew how the San Diego County coordinate entry system worked. If you go to Orange County, it's a completely different system. Um, and so you, you might have to relearn the, the process. The key steps for a coordinate entry is identification and assessment. So you wanna be able to identify who is experiencing homelessness, uh, get them into HMIS, and then do whatever assessment the continuum of care dictates should be done. And again, it'll differ by each community. There will be a prioritization and referral process. So we're gonna use vulnerability. We're gonna use the assessment we did to identify who is the most vulnerable. And then we're going to refer them to what we feel is the most appropriate COC or for very well-run coordinated entry systems. This could include non-COC funded programs as well too. So that could be something, could be a short-term stay in a shelter, could be a rapid rehousing project that has an opening, or sometimes it could be a permanent supportive housing project that happened to have a available voucher and this individual met the prioritization criteria. Once you're in a program, you'll the individual you're working with should be assigned a case manager as well as follow-up. And so I think for our purposes, one of the key things to keep in mind is that even when that assignment has happened, it, it could still be important for us to stay in touch with that individual, especially if you're an outreach worker. Not all case management hands off, handoffs work. Sometimes a program might not be the right fit 
for an individual. And it's important if you've developed a relationship with that individual to try to keep it for as long as, as you reasonably can to make sure that they are stably housed, or in the very least, that there is a warm handoff, that the individual you've worked with at the encampment, they've gotten into a temporary or semi-permanent or permanent program, that this case manager knows who you are and the relationship that you built with this individual. Because I know when we've done encampment work, we will get individuals either in shelter or house or to that next step. And then a month later, they're back at the encampment. And sometimes I feel if we'd had a little bit better, kind of warmer handoff or a way to be able to, to tell if someone was struggling at, at the program that we placed them in, that we might've been able to keep them there longer until they were stabilized, but instead they're back in the encampment or back on the street. There definitely is mixed emotions to coordinate entry. Sometimes communities kind of struggle to be able to get it to operate. I'll focus only on the benefits. So it does provide streamline access. So back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s when I was doing this work, uh, there definitely was much more of a lottery aspect to how individuals would get housed. So if someone appeared at the right day at the right time when there was an open unit, they would get that unit. And so the idea with coordinated entry is to take that chance out of it and really prioritize who is most in need and who is most vulnerable and who is the best fit for the project as well too, which creates a fair and equitable distribution. And then finally, Back to my previous example, there were oftentimes agents, or I mean, still are today, but agencies would work in silos. And if you got into one program's shelter, you were then expected that you were probably going to move to their transitional project, and then maybe you would move to their permanent housing program. The idea behind coordinated entry is it's not a siloed approach to homelessness, but that you could get into one agency's shelter. You could get moved to a different agency's rapid rehousing program, and then maybe you get into a permanent supportive or affordable housing program that's run by housing authority. So you're dealing with three different agencies, but the process of coordinated entry is to try to make that a seamless process. Um, I think I've kind of gone over these. There'll be an initial contact. You should definitely get to know and I'll talk about how to meet your coordinated or how to meet your continuum of care in each of your communities. But when it's done, most of them have a coordinated entry lead. So someone who is responsible for doing the coordinated entry within the community. We should definitely try if you have newer staff or this has all been kind of a learning curve today's presentation, reach out to that individual when you identify them because they will gladly discuss with you at length their local coordinated entry process and how you can assist in making the initial contact uh, with their staff as well as with yours. Places and locations in your community where an assessment can be completed, so the vulnerability assessment. And then uh, one of the unique things that each community is going to have is they're all going to have very different ways for referral and placement. So some communities have hotel vouchers, shelters that they specifically designate designate for individuals that are on the queue as they're going to move into a, a more permanent option. But oftentimes that's not immediate. It may take a day, it may take a week, it may take several months. Um, and so getting to understand that process is going to be critical because particularly for outreach workers, you want to make sure you have a good understanding when you're putting someone in, say, a temporary location that you may still see them at the encampment. There are still their friends there. They still have a long history there. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but they're that's also just part of the process that you know you don't necessarily need to work with them as long as they are staying not at night and are, are staying in their temporary referral uh, placement. Um, and then ultimately on to placement to the models that we talked about, transitional, rapid, or permanent supportive housing. Um, talked a lot about the collaborative approach. So we can get into how to find your local continuum of care. So as I said at the beginning, the geography of a continuum of care 
should mostly be county in California, but that's not the rule. And so there are plenty of exceptions. And so if you go to, I found this, oh, at the bottom right, contact a COC. If you click on that, this is on the HUD exchange. So just Google HUD exchange. Um, you can click in your geography and find your continuum of care. So it should give you a, what's called a lead agency and a point of contact. For that, you could either Google that agency and they should have a website that lists all of the work that they've done and all of the work groups and, and committee meetings that you could possibly join in. You could also just contact them. They have to have an email address as well too and explain how you'd like to participate or what your role is in your community and um, see how you can get involved. Because it's certainly on the outreach side in particular, that there may not be as much coordination as I feel should happen. So um, I like to get outreach workers talking regardless of their funding stream, because I think there are a lot of outreach workers who do this out of passion and not for a paycheck. And so making sure that we have their participation as well as um, all of those that are uh, outreach workers or in California too, we also have a lot of um, mental health outreach workers as well too. And so kind of a good thing to be able to do is, is meet monthly with all of the outreach workers. So if that is not something that's ongoing in your community, it could be something that uh, you recommend and maybe even help lead. There's there's no um, membership usually or criteria for joining. If you want to help the homeless, if um, you work in this field in some capacity, either volunteer or, or through I don't know, salary, you can participate in a continuum of care and we are encouraged to. One way, just as you're waiting to kind of get an idea of sort of what's going on, that I think could be helpful for you to think through is on that same page that I documented, this page, there is a link uh, to be able to get, once you click to your COC, to identify or to be able to look at what their housing inventory chart is. So uh, continuums of care have a lot of federal requirements. One is that they use HMIS. Another one is that they document every unit of housing, regardless of if they fund it or not, that is in their community. Um, and it'll break it down by shelter, um, temporary or trans transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, as well as rapid rehousing projects. But if you're just getting started to this field, it can really give you an idea of all of the different programs that exist throughout your community so that you have a very good idea of Kind of what services are are eligible. They there can be a struggle sometimes. I mean, they should include all programs. I think in California it can be a little bit of a challenge, especially over the last couple of years. There's been so much funding with COVID. Some of the programs may not be there, but it at least will give you a very good idea of of what exists, um, particularly around emergency shelters or um, safe havens as well. Too are going to be a very useful resource that. That if that you have one in your community, for those that don't know, a safe haven is specifically designed pretty much for our population of uh, for encampment uh, residents that can offer temporary, could be a one day, could just be a drop-in center um, for them to be able to be able to get mental health services, just basic human need services, um, and other programs like that, that um, it's idle to kind of know what are all the services nearby in our community. So that is we're working with individuals in an encampment. Our long-term options may take some time, but it's good to know what are some of our short-term options that uh, if individuals are ready to leave the encampment, that we know where the shelters are, we know which transitional housing projects possibly exist nearby and which safe havens are available. Oh, there we go. I just said all of this. Um, yeah, I think that is it. I mean, I don't know, Matt, is there anything you want to add or if there's questions or comments? No, I think we can stop the recording.